Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. When I asked Doug Muzio, the host of City Talk and a public affairs professor, what he thinks the term middle class means, he went and invited John Mollenkopf, the director of the Center for Urban Research, CUNY Graduate Center, and Andrea Batista Schlesinger, the executive director of the Drum Major Institute for Public Policy, to join us while we tried to figure that out. So welcome to Eldridge and Company. This is the first part of a conversation about the middle class. Doug will host the second half. So I get to ask the first question, and what is it that we mean when we talk about the middle class? Or should I say, what is it you mean when you talk about the middle class? Well, there are lots of different ways to define it, obviously. And partly it's subjective and, and in the eye of the beholder. But the way we define it in our work is, is simply by looking at the income distribution and taking the middle third and looking at, at how that has changed. So that goes from, in your figures, what does that go from? Well, roughly any household with incomes b below $30,000 is a on the lower end, and we picked sixty thousand dollars in real that. real dollars as being in the upper third, and th that's roughly how the uh, income distribution breaks down. Of course, a lot of people would say you you're not really even middle class. You're hardly even getting into right. the middle class if you have a sixty thousand right. dollar household. And income. Andrea, what do you? Yeah, well, we wanted to but. find an answer to the same question. <laughs> so what we did, uh, the Drum Major Institute, is we surveyed okay. around a hundred leaders from a variety of sectors: business, academia, government, um, you know, advocates, and we asked them, to you, what does it take? middle class income wise? What does it take to, uh, you know, what do you have to earn to be middle class? But then, and, and the answers were actually interesting. For a family right. of four, uh, they, there was consensus that it took between seventy five and one hundred and thirty five thousand um, dollars. And, you know, at least forty five thousand dollars to be a, to be an individual. If you were just a single person. If you were person. just a single person living in the city. So, you know, obviously higher than, you know, what it looks yeah. like when you just do the quintiles. But then we asked them, you know, besides income, what are, what are the quality of life pieces that mean that you're living, a, mm -hmm. you have a middle class standard of living in the city? And obviously in New York City it's different than on other places. Um, and it's, you know, having a full time job, having access to health insurance, being able to send your kid to a good public school, being able to afford your, your housing. And those were the qualities. And actually, interestingly and enough, to go it to also the movies every once in a while. Well, that wasn't on there. But owning a computer with internet access—that's interesting—was also one of the wow. answers yeah. that had overwhelming consensus. Yeah. Doug, sure. what do you think? Uh, well, I think it, it, there's both Andrea and, and John said it's a, it's a multiplicity of things. It's socioeconomic. It's lifestyle. It's cultural. It means a great many things. But at root. It comes down to how much disposable income you have. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's income. We don't usually talk about class in the United States and define it, you know, rigorously. But Yeah, but it's also so, it's, it's but, income that, that clears sort of basic and necessary right. and okay. customary costs. Okay. Right. okay. I, I read and this, New York is a costly yeah, city. Very for expensive. A variety of I read a congressional uh, research uh, paper that was done about what's the middle class, and what do you call them, quintiles, is that mm -hmm. how you pronounce them? They took the three middle quintiles, that's five different levels, mm -hmm. and then the, guy, the person who wrote it said, but now we talk about middle class, it could go up to as high as 150 or 200,000 or even more in, in places. So it's a, it's a very, and, and what, ha, what let me just go back a little bit, because you know I've been around for a while, so I remember Back, for instance, the 68 campaign, Bobby Kennedy was a strong candidate because he was able to talk to blue collar workers and white collar workers. Do we dis have that distinction anymore? Manufacturing jobs, really, when you have one, it really puts you in a class, middle class, doesn't it, the income? Well, it depends. I don't think necessarily a, a being behind a sewing machine in a garment factory puts you in the middle class, and that's what most of the manufacturing jobs Today, that are actually in the city. production jobs still are in the city. Yeah. There well, are lots of other kinds of. But I yeah. think we have to talk a little bit both national and and city. I think we well, need and, to do and that. I think some of the here. some of the trends are the same. But I think the important thing to talk about when we when we talk about middle class and especially defining those jobs uh, middle class by jobs is that you know the middle class isn't a naturally occurring phenomenon. And so it was public policy that took those jobs that you're referring to and that were previously kind of white collar jobs or good jobs. You know, it was public policy that made those jobs good jobs. And now, you know, when you have unionization at its lowest point, and even though it's strong in New York, most of that is service. It's service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't yeah. have the same kind of thinking about jobs and the middle class 
and how that traditionally defined as but, a gender. But that is also one of the things that does account for the great discrepancy and the gap between the salaries, right? Is the fact that the unions aren't there to really exert any kind of pressure as far as the adherence to wages and and even to corporate responsibility. You know, a lot of middle office jobs have moved out of the city. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, if you looked at New York Life or uh, you know any other big life insurance company, they would have had floors and floors of people mm -hmm. sitting at desks processing paper. None of those. Those jobs, many of them don't even exist anymore because things have become computerized. Well, so what, what were those people, though? They could be in India. They no, I don't mean that, Indiana. but I mean, what would you classify those people as, middle class? Yes, I'm sure they were middle thought, of, thought of themselves as middle class at, at that time. How do you describe in the city the great <clears throat> distinction? I mean, the Wall Street bonuses this year supposedly were around $25 billion. That's half, mm -hmm. more, a little bit less than half of the city budget. $25 billion, don't they change the whole scale of what we're talking about? I mean, I'm certainly Absolutely. not, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly not in that class, right. the same class as they are. However you look at the changing income distribution over time, you clearly see a rise at the top end. And if you talk about what share of the earnings gains are going to the top half, the top 10%, the top 2%, the top one-tenth of a percent, the higher up you go, the more disproportionate the share of the gains. So, so clearly, at the top end of the labor market, New York is producing fantastically well for it. And then, but but then you have to think ahead. about the public policy implications of that. So right. once we become addicted to that presence, both of those individuals and the money they we're make, so dependent on them. and the industry, then what are the public policy implications for the rest of the city? Sure. So, you know, what do you do about subsidies to keep businesses here? And then, what does that mean in terms of that money not being available to invest in the kind of public infrastructure that everybody else needs? So, you know, it's there are implications beyond the fact that it's just you know outs that it's cr incredible. There are public policy implications. Oh, definitely the reliance when, and the reliance yeah. on the revenue that we get from them, right? It's, and you know, I mean, there was an article in the Times, you know, several yeah. months ago. Do we even need a middle class? Because if right. we have all those high earners, right. then do we even need it? Well, and that was a question that I was going to raise. I mean, <laughs> on one level, you have the the luxury brand, the, the city of the elite, you know, the city as, you know, Manhattan south of 96th Street. I mean, there's a value judgment here that we're making that the middle class is good and that there are real bad societal implications for this increasing income inequality that John's talking about. Do, why, why the middle class? Mario Cuomo at the conference at, at Baruch that uh, Baruch co-sponsored with DMI, he talked about Aristotle and the middle class. What does the middle class bring to the city, John? Well, I, I, I think everybody who's looked at it, and many political scientists have, think that, uh, and he referred to Jefferson as well, I mean, our founding fathers as well as the great political theorists, the, the greater the inequality, the more uh, possibility of, of, of clashes between the classes, and the more incentive to have class uh, legislation that, that favors one mm -hmm. group over the other as opposed to thinking about the good of the whole. Do we, do we consider middle income, this, is that an interchangeable term with middle class? I don't think so. What do you think the difference is? I think middle class connotes in, in our conversations um, a certain way of life. And if you, the, the middle class, especially in this town, isn't the same thing as those who are earning a middle income. I mean, one thing that was really notable about uh, the But the they people, are earning a middle income. They may be earning a middle income, but the question is, can it What's still afford right. what people traditionally think is a middle class right. standard of living? Right. Well, then I think then, then, then you gave a minimum <clears throat> standard of living for middle class. A middle link, a middle stand, a, a, a minimum mi standard of, of, of income. Right. For so, what the middle class. I mean, so what's the difference between what you get? I'm sorry, John, but let me just. What's the difference be, between what you gave as a definition for middle class and for middle income? Well, that wasn't our definition. I mean, that was essentially yeah, us know, surveying but, 100 but, but people. We, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think what they were saying is what's the minimum that it takes to live a middle class lifestyle? And so what does that mean? That's about what you can buy, which is somewhat dependent also on what exists. So if and the if you and what it costs <clears throat> and you know and and so if you earn a certain income but because of a lack of investment you've got poor school options next to you then your income needs to either enable you to move out of the city or enable you to purchase private education mm -hmm. 
So it's, you know, the middle, the, the income required is so much less telling unless you put it in the, in the context of what that money buys and but, what's available to buy. See, I'm going back to the old, when I grew up, the old definition. I'm middle class was to me uh, the intellectuals, the teacher, the professors, the writers, uh, people in the creative, a lot of creative mm -hmm. people. I'm not talking about those people who break out and make millions and millions of dollars that, in unnatural kind of range of salaries. You, but you've lived in Manhattan all your life. You have to go out to Queens and, and, and right. Brooklyn to see right. a different middle class, the middle class that well, I grew also up the, in. The number of people living in New York that hold professional jobs has increased over right. time. Right. You could argue that some of the, you know, the professional status isn't what it used to be. At one point, the uh, salaries of faculty members at the City University of New York were national leaders. Now they w lag well behind, you know, most of the other large public. But they still take you out of the middle class. They still take us out of the middle class, but New York is not affording. But do you consider yourself to be middle class? Oh, definitely. So do I. So, so, so how do we then fit into these definitions? Well, because it, you know, I and think the And when you say, does New York City need the middle class? That's when right. I start. But I, to, you know. I mean, I think roughly we're talking about those, and this is what um, you know what Governor Cuomo said: is people who need to work, yeah. who don't have the choice not to work. Um, and that essentially, you know, I, I mean, that provides a little bit of an indicator of who we're talking about. We're not talking about the Wall Street people who are earning, you know, billions of dollars in bonuses, but we are talking about the people who can, who aspire to own a home or who own it, um, you know, who want to be able, and it's an expectation that they can send their children to college but are having trouble paying for it. You know, I think it's less important to define specifically who the middle class is and to think about, you know, and this is part of why we did this conference and why we said let's look at who this middle class is, is to say that the range of problems that we used to think of as just impacting the poor are actually affecting more oh, and more people up the income spectrum. Right. And we happen to live in a country where 80% of Americans view themselves as middle class. So there's a, there, there's a rhetorical importance to using that lens. And this, this topic really struck a nerve. I mean, all of the speakers Absolutely. from Mario Cuomo to Congressman Weiner to um, many other eminent people who were part of the, the panels were saying, well, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure that uh, I, I'm feeling more insecure maybe than my parents did mm -hmm. who, who grew up in New York, and I'm, I'm not sure my kids would be able to replicate the same. Well, having right. kids who were at that right. age, that, that, that's absolutely the case, <laughs> and particularly when you look at the data that you've been looking at, John, and the data that the Brookings Institute looked at. We have the thinnest in New York middle class in 100 metropolitan areas, but it's a phenomenon that's nationwide where both the number the second of... second thinnest after Los Angeles. Well, we, yeah, one of them was the, the number smallest, of individuals. Well, proportionally the smallest number of, of, of middle class neighborhoods. Right. But yeah. Right. So Which you talk is, about individuals yeah. and neighborhoods, we are at the bottom or mm -hmm. the near bottom well, on every one of those measures. But with, with looking at a national phenomenon here, that the cities, in a sense, are being, to use your phrase, hollowed out of the middle class, where, where does the middle class go and how do their lifestyles change? Well, out to the suburbs, out to the exurbs. And um, buy the houses that they're now having trouble keeping. Right. And, and very yeah. long commutes. Now, my kids can't live in the city. They haven't moved. They've moved out of the city because they can't afford it. So, and I grew up in what I consider to be the quintessential middle class neighborhood, the Upper West Side. It wasn't even called the Upper West Side. Then it was called the West Side. Then the Upper West Side used to be a little higher, and then you had Washington Heights. But that's all changed, and that's changed. Let's come back to why it's changed. And I, I realize I'm talking about Manhattan. My husband grew up in Ozone Park. He grew up on a corner in, an apartment, in a building, a private building in Ozone, in Ozone Park, where he drove past last week, it's been torn down, made into built condos, and the condos start at three hundred thousand. So, I, you know, mm -hmm. that's what happens is it gets the the West Side is certainly not considered middle class these days, right? So it's, you've got this gentrification the, of these neighborhoods, and, right? And then people move; they mm -hmm. move to Brooklyn. Brooklyn's been gentrified. They move further out in Brooklyn. They move to moving to Long Island. They're clearly I mean, it's, a, more affordable parts of the city than yeah. Manhattan in, in the other boroughs, in neighborhoods like, like Richmond Hill and... Right. But that's and getting, and that's so going on. up though, too. Well... That's, so I mean, that brings well, us back to the first question, is where know, did the people go? But not the good really old where days were not necessarily the middle of the 70s, where large swaths of the right. city talking about, no, I'm talking about the 50s. no value. Yeah. I mean, were, houses were being abandoned. So. Right. 
Um, what we want is some kind of equilibrium where the where there's a growing supply of decent housing and decent neighborhoods with decent schools. And, and the perception is that that's been, and I think the Brookings report uh, puts numbers behind it, that that, you know, that circumstance has been contracting somewhat in New York over the past 20 years. And I think it's also important to say that, you know, in terms of this question is that, and how do we formulate policy that actually responds to this is a city of renters. And so, you know, I mean, thinking just about how people can afford to buy these homes, that's one piece. And actually, in our survey, affordable rent was, was the top challenge. And, and buying a home was somewhat lower than that. Right. Um, but it's a question of affordable rent. And so, you know, we need to figure out how to formulate policies that actually respond to where the bulk of, the, of, the, of New York City's middle class and aspiring middle class, that, that's where they're living and how they're living. So well, let's, let's respond to that. Do you think New York could do that alone? Or is that not? very dependent on what happens in the country and well, in the of world. Well, it's dependent, but, we've, done, but we've also done it. And this is where, you know, this kind of sense of impossibility where, invades. Have we and done I think it? that well, we, did we it have the cre years. We've, we've, we've created well, we bastions of middle class housing. housing. I mean, if you look historically, both in the 1880s and 90s, right. and when, in the 1940s all, when, and the when trolley car New York was built right. out, and then in the, the, the 50s, the late 40s and 50s mm -hmm. and into the 60s, when the rest of the more suburban parts of the city in places like Canarsie uh, right. got developed. But can yeah. we do it without having more revenue from the federal government? Can the I mean, can can we do that? I I and can we do that without changing the current tax structure? I don't know why that's the question. In fact, uh, I mean, this is a city where if there is benefit, people will accept surcharges on their income tax, for example, mm -hmm. if the reason is we need to put more cops on streets, if the reason is we need to figure out how to give teachers more money. If we put something yeah, on the, the table now... but the politicians don't ever seem to be willing to do that, do they? Well, but they do occasionally, but yeah, but this is part... Those are the conversations right. I think we need to have. The right. conversations... Uh, people are ahead of politicians on this when it comes to, especially in this city, being willing to put their tax dollars forward if it means a stronger infrastructure. So, but I don't think the question is, can we do this unless the federal government chips in? I think the question is, what what is the cost if we don't do this? Right. And what is the cost, for well, example, of not building? The mayor's 2030 analysis shows that the city's going to grow by a million people. They're talking about a how, increasing the housing stock by 165,000. There's, there's a huge shortfall here. What do we do? Let's talk policy. How do we go from needing this much housing to producing it? Is there the technical capacity and the political will to do it? I think... Housing policy is at a, a turning point or a crisis mm -hmm. point in New York City right now because we took so many properties through NREM beginning in the mid 70s that it created. With the city took over the buildings for non payment, non -payment of, taxes. of taxes. And that created a huge reservoir of developable uh, sites and, and redevelopable, rehabable structures. And all the, the city's housing policies really run on that since the mm -hmm. Koch 10 year plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, right through pretty much to the last couple of years. Well, we've developed all of that. So then the question is, where's the new, where are the new development sites going to come from? And I think the Bloomberg administration has been creative and um, showing leadership in terms of saying, well, we've got to find new sites and we're going to look at all the old schools. We're going to look at Municipal parking lots. We're going to look at any any brownfields, brownfields, decking any, over the Brooklyn anything Queens anything Express. Right. Can I, can I, just explain to right. me. So this new housing is planned for people of what income? Well, they have set themselves an ambitious target of producing affordable units. And the other part of the crisis in the housing system is that we don't really have a national housing policy anymore. We exactly. we're not That's building any true. public housing. We do have Section 8, but uh, there are severe constraints on the number of Section 8 vouchers and the, the number of vouchers. And then when you have a voucher, where you go? And Right. So on the fine, and New York has stepped up to the plate more than any other local jurisdiction in saying we're going to borrow against our own assets to put, put money into developing these units. But... Um, you know, but what you, do we mean when we right. say affordable? That's and I think that's <coughs> part of um, I think that's a key question because I th and that's part of why we need to talk not just in traditional terms about these issues, but expand it to include people higher up on the spectrum who feel equally fragile because those are also people who need access to affordable right. housing. I don't think even if rhetorically 
We've, we are beginning to become more comfortable talking about the, the implications of the middle class squeeze mm -hmm. uh, for the city. I don't think that is yet reflected in, in our housing but, agenda. But think, but, think about, it's, I mean, it's, New York in the past has shown a great deal of policy creativity in addressing this program, mm -hmm. power yeah. problem, because it's not new. Think about all the housing that got built under Mitchell Lama. Right. And Mitchell right, Lama but Mitchell Lama, unfortunately, stopped. never really did what it was supposed to do. It seemed to me it was supposed to be not permanent housing for the people. You were supposed to have a flow through Mitchellama into other housing. It stopped, so it became mm -hmm. just housing for people who stayed there forever. It, well, didn't, it, it didn't contribute to a mobility you know, there, there of is, society There is at turnover all. in Mitchellama, but the, the, good, point, but the point being uh, is that you know, units are coming out uh, of the end of their, of their obligations to the uh, program. And people are buying out. You know, so the members. stock is being diminished, and we, we have no comparable scale thinking about how the government can be a catalyst to develop, uh, you know, the well, mayor's... We, do, we, the mayor's we did have it. We allowed the, the real estate right. developers and the right. tenants to make a killing and other, I mean, to, you know, to buy out and then sell apartments at very and high One of the interesting things in this survey, as well as that. They, the, the respondents were given, and again, across the board, politically, ideologically, um, they were given choices between voluntary, uh, voluntary inclusionary zoning, where people right. Right. and a mandatory include, and there was overwhelming support for a mandatory right. inclusionary zoning because was, they don't trust so, everybody else. Well, not exactly. To do it. Well, but well, you know, well, those are the kinds of things where people are ahead of politicians on this. So now, you know, if we can help create this momentum, then it's possible that you know that but, mandatory inclusionary zoning becomes the that that's the minimum. But you know, so much of it is dependent. I mean, we see things so differently, and I feel as if I really want to understand, but. The inclusionary housing was also a hoax in a way because it allowed all this luxury development to be built at very high prices with tax abatements. So we lost the revenue, and I don't know what. And here you had apartments selling in, in my neighborhood for two million more two million dollars, and they're not paying any real estate taxes. So it it was a policy driven by real estate interests. It seems to me that's what the difference. If we had government driven policy, I think it right. would be much better. But we've been so reliant on the very same people, the people who make the money in the business. We are not a pure government by any means. I mean, as far right. as who who really influences the policy. Please. Well, I think that's part of what Mayor Bloomberg's trying to do in terms of putting this all in the context of what's the city going to look like in 30 years. Right. Um, yeah. Is try to reframe that conversation away and look at things as linked. And that's you know, you, I mean, you can't do housing on one day and then talk tax policy on the next day and then talk about the environment and the schools on the fourth day. I mean, it's these things together. are all it's all together. So and we so should we, give Bloomberg credit for looking ahead. I mean, well, absolutely. That planning and we need to talk about the comprehensiveness of the approach, and we'll do that in, the you know, in, in the next half hour. But what I want to touch on now is you're listening to the rumblings of the 2008 presidential election, more than rumblings, it's loud. And, you, you know, you, you're hearing the, the rumblings of the 2009 mayoral election. And in fact, at that conference, there were three of the, the putative uh, mayoral candidates. Are any of the city candidates talking a middle class agenda, and what does that agenda include, and how realistic they is it? They always have talked a middle class agenda. Well, though. let's see. That's the problem. What are they? What are they? What did you think they meant? Well, that <laughs> was part of what question. we tried to ascertain <laughs> right. at the conference. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I think it. Uh, Doug was obviously easier on his uh, on his candidates, but I think uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean. Well, you had a rougher group of candidates. I did have a rougher group of candidates. You know. I, I don't know that they yet have their agendas. You know, Representative Weiner has a, a middle class taxation proposal that's a kind of temporary, I believe it's temporary reform of the AMT, and then he's got ideas about how to make the income tax structure more progressive in the city. The that's AMT something that, being? The alternative minimum right. tax. Um, and he's got proposals, sorry. Um, he's got proposals <laughs> to, um, to make uh, the income tax structure in New York City more progressive. So that's something he's floating. You know, Speaker Quinn, who wasn't there, she's got her tax... Um, credit for renters, renters. Uh, to respond again to the to to the fact that the majority of, 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 of New Yorkers are renters so you know I think they're floating proposals um, but I think there's no there's no doubt that in 2009 what to do about the city's vanishing middle class will be at the top of any candidate's yeah. agenda Don't John you let's let me interrupt for a second you're the advisor to the new mayor mm -hmm. <laughs> what's 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 your advice in terms of dealing with this issue. I mean, it's massive, it's interconnected. Right. What do you tell this, this person? Well, well, certainly pushing forward on the affordable housing agenda is something that a new mayor will have to do 
just because it is at the top of the agenda and it's a, a mm -hmm. deeply felt need by a wide variety of people in New York City. But I, I would tend to come at it more from the point of view of the labor market, what people are earning, what kind of career ladders there are, and to, uh, to do more work on making sure that high school graduates in New York City who aren't going to college find ways into jobs that, that we, and this is already something that, uh, for example, the Department of Small Business Services works on, mm -hmm. but we could we could make a bigger and more concerted effort to make sure that um, the jobs that the New York City economy are go, are, are, is producing are, are going to New Yorkers and the people in those jobs find ladders of upward mobility and aren't just stuck in the, the lowest wage, least uh, benefits mm -hmm. type, of, type of situation. I know that you think that the city has to address its problems, but it's, it, don't you need, if you were a new mayor, and if I was a mayor, don't you need to integrate policies with the state? Don't we need to examine that whole relationship that's Absolutely. so basic to anything that we can do, both the state and the federal government, but the state particularly, especially with the housing or taxation? We, or education. It, it, all the, the proposals that Healthcare. you meant are all patches. I mean, there's no fundamental looking at a fundamental reform of systems, and that's what really I find the most difficult in the public policy political thing. I think that we're going to come to the end of this half hour. Time flies. So, um, and now <laughs> Doug will be able to ask the out. questions as if he didn't. Nice. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> nice. no, I mean, come on, give me a break. We're going to continue mm -hmm. this conversation on City Talk, so please stay tuned. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.